Hey, I'd like to meet that guy. <laughs> well, it's a distinct pleasure for me to be here. It is the first time I've returned to Drake campus since 1957. I've not been on this campus since I left it and transferred to Wheaton, Illinois. So you can imagine the pleasure it's been for me to just walk Great Campus. See, Old Main is still here, <laughs> and some of the other buildings. And this library was my library where I studied as I commuted from my home at 1831 East 12th Street in Des Moines, Iowa, through Union Park to campus. I had a problem finding a parking place already in 1955, <laughs> and I understand that hasn't changed a whole lot. But it is a pleasure to be with you. This nation suffered the greatest war in its history. A tremendous amounts of debt. Over 620,000 military, plus the civilian count. By April of 1865, there was a sense of victory in the air for the northern side of that country. On April 14, 1865, on a carriage drive with Mrs. Lincoln in the afternoon of that day, he told his wife that he believed that this day the war was over, although technically, of course, it would continue until June of 65. But in his thinking, the Lee surrender to General Grant at Appomattox on April 9th, and he had been at the City Point visiting with General Grant and the staff there before, came back to Washington on the 9th, hadn't heard about the surrender until the next day when Cannon started shaking the place, and on the night of the 9th he received a telegram saying that Lee had surrendered. The campus, I should say, the grounds of the White House was filled with people the evening of the 10th, calling for a speech. He wasn't prepared for a speech. But he did ask a Marine band to play a tune that he said was fairly captured. Fairly captured. It was a tune he said he liked. And I always thought it was a good tune. To be honest with you, he wasn't much of a singer. I don't know if he could have sung the thing. But he asked the Marine band to play Dixie. And they did. He said he prepared, he prepared to speak the next evening. And he was prepared on April 11th to speak from the North Portico. Every time I'm at the White House, I always look up at the North Portico. I call it Jackson's Portico, built in 1829, on the north side of the White House. And there's a window above that entrance in the middle, right above the main door. And from that window, Lincoln often spoke to crowd below on the White House grounds. There were Jefferson windows in the White House in those days. You could take the lower sash and push it all the way up and have a complete clearance at that window site. They used those for the East Room, and they would put up planks for entering and exiting the East Room at receptions using those Jefferson windows, which became openings. And that window was open for Lincoln to speak the night of April 11th. And he did, to a crowd that went beyond the White House grounds down Pennsylvania Avenue. And he talked in terms of reconstruction. And he called for a franchise in Louisiana for black Union soldiers and literates as well. There was a young man in the audience who was 26 years old, and he turned to his friend and said, that means black suffrage, but he used the N word. And he said, by God, I'll run him through. That was John Wilkes Booth, who heard Lincoln call for the franchise as a white supremacist and a loyal Confederate involved in underground activity for the Confederacy. He had made a sworn promise. That's the 11th of April. On the 14th, Lincoln held his last cabinet meeting. General Grant was there to report about Appomattox. But that morning, Robert had been back home. He had slept all night. He was tired. But he reported to his father about Lee's surrender at Appomattox, and he had a photograph, a small carte de visite of General Lee, and he showed it to his father, who called it a noble face, and said, I'm glad the war is over. After a very business, busy cabinet meeting, and of course, Grant, most people in other words, had initially accepted to go to the theater. 
but Mrs. Grant decided she did not want to spend an evening with Mrs. Lincoln in the same box and had her husband tell the president they were going to visit their children in New Jersey instead, which of course they would. And as they left Washington, Mrs. Grant reported that a rider came by the carriage and peered into it with an ugly face staring at them. She later identified that face as that of Booth. Lincoln, knowing none of this, had a wonderful day. He and Mrs. Lincoln talked about their future, what they would do after their White House years. They talked of travel. They talked of going to Europe. They talked of going to France and to Germany and to England to visit their friend, the former pastor, who was in Scotland. And then they talked of going across the mountains to California to thank the miners for digging out the gold and silver, helping to pay for the war debt. Some of his last conversations with the Speaker of the House before the carriage left and others was to tell the California miners, thank you. Please thank them for their part in paying off the debt of war. And meanwhile, they were late to the theater. And when they came in, of course, Withers struck up the band, hail to the chief. The audience cheered the president and his party as they entered, sat down in the box, and the rocker he had sat in many times before from John Ford's bedroom was in place, and Mrs. Lincoln's small chair next to it. The Rathbones across the way, Miss Clara Harris and uh, her fiancé Henry Rathbone sitting on the divan and she on a chair. Mrs. Lincoln snuggled up to her husband and put her hand in his, and they continued for a while to talk a little about their travels in the future. And she was looking at him, and commented, what will Miss Harris think of me hanging on to you so? And he looked down at her and smiled and said, she'll think nothing of it. It was about that moment when he saw General Ambrose Burnside walk into Ford's and he put his hand down and he moved the curtains aside to see Ambrose Burnside's entry. So his head tipped forward. It was at that moment that Booth, having stolen into the box, having given a pass to Charles Forbes, who allowed him in the box, proceeded to stand behind the president and pull his 44 Derringer, crashing a bullet into his head, entering behind the left ear, crossing the cranial cavity, lodging behind the right eye. Mrs. Lincoln felt the whole Holding his hand, she felt it enter his body, and the jolt, she held him in the chair, and she screamed. They could hear her scream all the way down the street. It was a blood curtain scream. As Booth proceeded to leap over the box, Rathbone caught him by the clothes, and slashed his dagger, and opened up a huge wound between the left elbow and the shoulder of uh, their guest, who let go of the clothes as Booth comes below and broke his left tibia, crippling across the stage, leaving the theater by a horse, kicking peanuts in the face as he went on the road. <coughs> Imagine putting a broken leg into the saddle, getting on a horse, the pain was incredible. Meanwhile, the president's taken across the street and dies at 7.22 and 10 seconds past, the morning of April 15th. And just before Lincoln died, a small smile spread across his facial features. Relieved of the pain and the weariness of war, he smiled as he entered eternity. When the body was prepared for burial, Stanton ordered that the embalmers put the smile back on <coughs> that face. And it was replaced. And in 1901, a friend of mine named Fleetwood Lindley, who had been 13 year old, years old at the time he saw Lincoln finally buried under two tons of cement, told me personally he could still see the smile on the face of the dead president.
This nation was thrust into tremendous grief. The first assassinated president in American history. Other presidents had been threatened. There was one who attacked Andrew Jackson in the rotunda area and both pistols failed to fire. And supposedly, the story is told, caned the fellow. There were other warnings to presidents of the United States. Lincoln had so many warnings that his life was endangered from the moment of the election in November of 1860. But now the nation prepared a funeral. And what a funeral. Almost 1,700 mile funeral, 1,700 approximate miles. He would travel the approximate course he had taken out on his inaugural special, leaving Washington and headed on to Baltimore and eventually New York and up to Albany and then, of course, to Buffalo and down into Ohio and into Indiana, Indianapolis and Indiana, on to Michigan City where the train waited to go to Chicago and then from Chicago to Springfield. They would arrive in Springfield on May 3rd and the fourth would be the last day of an open coffin funeral. All the way it was an open coffin funeral. All the way. The body having been embalmed, had the trails had been removed, there was no brain because of the autopsy, it was basically sinew, muscle, bone, flesh. But by the time the remains got to New York for the funeral, they were having a problem with life and the features and preparing the body for viewing. The funeral procession arrived in New York City. It arrived that morning of April 24th, and 120,000 people will view the body in 24 hours. The problem was, and the papers warned, there were thieves and pickpockets, picking people's pockets, waiting to see Lincoln's remains. Shortly before the doors were opened to the public, Two photographs were taken, one would be destroyed, the other would be secreted away for 87 years, until a Sunday morning in 1952, when a 14-year-old boy from Des Moines recognized the sole remaining print of a four-lens plate taken that April morning. David Locke, an author whom President Lincoln had greatly admired, wrote these words in 1865. I saw him in his coffin. The face was the same as in life. Death had not changed the kind of countenance in any line. There was upon it the same sad look that it had worn always, though not so intensely sad as it had been in life. It was as if the spirit had come back to the poor clay, reshaped the wonderfully sweet face, and given it an expression of gladness. It was the look of a worn man, suddenly relieved. Death with a smile on the body. Brigadier General Edward D. E. Townsend also had seen, had seen, I should say, the kindness and the sadness and the relief in the face of his fallen commander-in-chief. Townsend was an adjutant general of the army, and he'd been a confidant to the late president. Years later, he would be responsible for assembling a vast collection of Civil War documents which would be known as the 128 volume War of the Rebellion, probably known better as the official records. In 1865, his keen sense of history compelled him to preserve the impression for posterity. It is today widely believed and thought that it was General Townsend who gave Jeremiah Gurney Jr., photographer and owner of New York's most fashionable Broadway portrait studio, special permission to photograph Abraham Lincoln lying on stage. The coffin lay on a huge catafalque in the rotunda of the city hall, which still stands today, open for the embalmer and undertaker to perfect their arrangements. And Admiral Charles H. Davis of the United States Navy took his place at the head of the coffin. General Townsend of the United States Army positioned himself at the foot of the coffin. The photographer Gurney granted exclusive right to photograph the scene came forward to do his work. That heavy drapery of the funerary decoration in the rotunda so dim the morning light it took a half an hour in order to make the two wet plate exposures. One a large plate with a funeral cortege from the train present 
and another multiple image stereo, a graphic negative, four images, a small plate. Various artists uh, sketched the historic scene, and when the press reported the story of Gurney's special privilege, photographers and artists deluged, besieged Secretary of War Edwin Stanton for like opportunity. And Mrs. Lincoln, confined by grief to her bedroom in the White House second floor, read a newspaper account of this dispute. She complained to Stanton about it. Secretary of War ordered the photographic plates as well as all the sketches and engravings to be seized and destroyed. At least one sketch and one photograph escaped the order. Stanton allowed no further photography. General Townsend pleaded for preservation of the Gurney plates, arguing, I quote, the picture would be a grand view of what thousands saw and thousands could not see. In spite of his efforts, the Gurney plates were seized by General John J. Peck. Gurney campaigned to save his plates and his prints. He enlisted the aid of Reverend Henry Ward Beecher of the Brooklyn Congregation Church and Henry J. Raymond, publisher of the New York Times and Lincoln's 1864 campaign manager. And their com combined efforts were reason enough for Stanton to reconsider. And so he gave Gurney permission to make one single print from that multiple image stereographic negative, which was still in the custody of General Peck. And Gurney's large plate and print had already been destroyed. On April 29, 1865, Gurney sent the album in print to Stanton, who then presented it to the president's son, Robert Todd Lincoln. <coughs> Aware of his mother's wishes, he ordered the print and the small plate destroyed. Stanton carried out the order, although he didn't have the heart to destroy that small print, which found a place among his personal papers. Twenty-two years later, his son, Lewis, found it in his father's papers and sent it to John Nicolay, Lincoln's secretary, who also would keep it from public view under lock and key. Because Robert Lincoln had allowed Nicolay and Hay to use his father's papers to work on their Abraham Lincoln history, they did not want to alienate Robert by publishing the photographs, so they secreted it away too. And as a young man, I had developed a serious interest in the life and times of President Lincoln. As a boy of 13, 14, I was not a well boy, so my life enjoyment was writing letters to people I read about in the Des Moines Register. Remember 1950, they published photographs of seven living Civil War veterans. I wrote every one of them. 101, 102, I wrote them letters, and a few answered my letter. In fact, some of the nurses picked up the pen until their wars passed from the scene. So I wrote Carl Sander. I had finished at 13 reading his entire set on Lincoln, Prairie Years and War Years. I wrote him what I thought of it. <laughs> I wrote him three letters, and unknown to me, he kept my letters complete with a three cent stamped envelopes, <laughs> which are today in the Sandberg papers at the University of Illinois Library. I wrote Judge Bollinger of Davenport, who retired as a judge, and um, I had realized that the judge was a serious Lincoln collector. He collected over 4,000 volumes, which he bestowed upon his demise to the State University of Iowa. I read about that in the paper, and I think I may have even written Clyde Walton, Jr., curator of the rare books at the university, uh, a note that I had known and corresponded with the judge. And I didn't receive any word back. I said, I'd sure like to attend the dedication. It would be November 19, 1951, heard nothing. And then I got a phone call. And it was Dr. Walton, who later became state historian of Illinois, and Dr. Walton said, Ronald, are you for real? Excuse me, he said, are you 14? I said, yes. Are you really that interested in Lincoln? He said, yes. He said, how would you like to come and be our guest for dedication? I said, I'd love to. So mother put me on the Rock Island rocket. Does anybody remember? 
in Des Moines, and I took it to Iowa City all by myself and was met by a lawyer uh, aunt, a lawyer friend of our family. His aunt lived in Iowa City, and, and she kept me for a few days while I went to the dedication. And there assembled were all the greats in the Lincoln Field at that time. Carl Sandburg wasn't there. But Harry Lytle, who was a friend of Bollinger's, introduced Paul Engel, director of the Chicago Historical Society, Harry Pratt, Illinois State historian, Benjamin Platt Thomas, treasurer of the Abraham Lincoln Association, and, I still think, one of the best or finest biographers of Lincoln. This was Abraham Lincoln, 1952, I still rank high. And Louis Warren, Louis A. Warren, who was the director of the Lincoln National Life Museum in Fort Wayne, and Louis Warren and I had already been corresponding friends since 1951, earlier. Each related something about the judge and his dedication to studying collecting Lincoln. And Bollinger's father had been a Union soldier. And his mother, as a young girl, had seen Lincoln. And Paul Engel said, I remember these words, he was always very careful, Bollinger was, to say that his mother had not heard Lincoln speak. But during the course of the Lincoln-Douglas debate, she and a group of girls had driven outside of the town in which they lived to see Lincoln drive past that morning. So it was with the feeling of a little more than casual closeness to Lincoln that he began his activities as a collector. While there, Dr. Harry Pratt took an interest in me. And he extended an invitation for me to visit Springfield the next summer and visit the Lincoln sites. He said that his new bride, Marion Dolores Pratt, who was then, of course, on the editorial staff of the collective works of Abraham Lincoln, would have me as their guest at their home. And they would take me to the Lincoln home and the tomb and New Salem and all of that. So they met me at a Greyhound bus depot in Springfield as I traveled all by myself from Des Moines Greyhound bus. I transferred to Galesburg, Illinois by myself to the bus to Springfield by myself and proceeded at 14 to arrive in Springfield in the Pratt's met me. On Sunday, July 20th, 1952, I accompanied him to the Illinois State Historical Library, then in the Centennial Building, while he worked on a review. I was allowed to peruse the papers of Lincoln's secretaries, John Hay and John Nicolay, which had been given to the library by the daughter of John Hay in 1943. One file proved especially interesting to me, contained a letter dated January 17, 1887, and it was addressed to John Nicolay in Washington, D.C from Louis Stanton, the Secretary of War's son. I quote, in going over my father's papers, I came across this enclosed photograph. Possibly it may be of use to you and Colonel Hay, though I do not think it probable. I would later recall these words. These are my words I wrote out at 14. I had the historical awareness at the moment to sit down and write out a piece of paper, <coughs> bits of library paper, what I had just found. I still have those original notes. July 20, 1952, I wrote. I was curious to see what this picture was that Stanton was being so secret about. So I opened it up and found a faded brown picture of some men standing by a coffin. Now remember, these are 14-year-old words. I looked, uh, I, the closer I looked, the more the figure in the coffin looked like Lincoln. I hurried into the office where Dr. Pratt was sitting immediately as I had. He recognized the long lost photograph. My mind had flashed to the single published engraving. Remember I said one sketch had escaped Stanton's destruction. And that was published in the Harper's Weekly of May 6, 1865. And at 14, I owned a copy of it. So I knew immediately where the photograph was taken, when it was taken, and the details of that. I told Dr. Pratt what I had found, and Dr. Pratt immediately said, let's go back to the Lincoln Horner room and check out my facts, which we did, which after looking at three books on the New York funeral, he pronounced had been correct. Then he added, I must keep still and say nothing until the research was done before the information would be released to the country. I promised him, with an added little chutzpah, <laughs> provided he'd give me a copy of the picture, which he said he would. And of course he did, and I kept my word. 
on September 14, 1952, AP released from New York that the long lost last photograph ever taken of Abraham Lincoln had been discovered in Illinois by a boy named Ronald Reedfeld of Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> but across the whole country. I still have the original press release, Dr. Pratt gave me, and the clippings from across the state of Illinois announcing the discovery. But you see, what's interesting about that, I had promised him I wouldn't say anything. And at 6 o'clock, 5.36 in the morning, here on East 12th Street, my mother is shaking me in my bed in my upstairs bedroom and saying, Ronald, Grandpa Riefeld just called and said your name's on the front page of the Des Moines Register. What did you do wrong? <laughs> And sleepily, I said, oh, it's that Lincoln photo I found last summer. What Lincoln photo? I was a good boy. I kept my word, Dr. Pratt. And he kept his as well. In fact, he uh, readily, I guess, agreed. He told Life Magazine, I quote, that I was a real Lincoln expert. <laughs> These are the words from Dr. Pratt. I'm quoting him. On September 14th, and the Associated Press made the release. On September 15th, Life magazine ran a large essay on it written by Stephen Laurent, whom the Pratt's wanted to have the first opportunity to publish the article on the picture. Well, the discovery also gave me an opportunity to personally visit with one who had known the president personally in life and death. After I found the photograph and was published on the front page of the Des Moines Register on September 14, I got a phone call from a man in southeast Des Moines. He said, Ronald, he said, that picture that was in the paper brought back memories for me. You see, my father was a gardener at the White House during the Lincoln years. And as a boy, I'd go visit my father, and often a couple of times a week I would see the president. And he said, when he died, my father took me to the funeral at the rotunda, and I was a little short, so he lifted me up so I could see his face in the coffin. And he said, that picture brought back all those memories. I said, man, how old are you? <laughs> and he said, I'm 96. Well, I had just turned 15 on the 22nd of September. All this was released on the 14th and 15th of September, when I was technically still 14, although Dr. Pratt had given my age as 15, providentially or prophetically. And he said, how would you like to come over and spend an afternoon with me, and we'll talk Lincoln? I said, I'd love that. Now, remember, 15, you can't drive yourself. So I had a mother <laughs> drive me over, which he readily agreed to and did. And his name was James Wheeler. His father was Thomas G. Wheeler. And he told me that Lincoln loved to play with him sometimes, for he was fond of kids and quite a joke. Lincoln loved kids. In fact, he told me there was a big fig tree on the White House lawn and that he used to help himself to the figs. Unquote. Mr. Lincoln would tease me about stealing his figs. But his most poignant recollections of Lincoln were concerned with his death and with the search for the assassin John Wilkes Booth. He remembered soldiers coming to his home at night in search of Booth. And then he related that the Lincoln coffin photograph had brought back memories for him, for he'd seen the president in death as well. My father took me to the Capitol, these are his words, for a last look at Lincoln. He was lying in state in the rotunda, and father lifted me up so as to see him better. That was 1952. Interestingly enough, in 1962, Ten years later, I had a request from the curator of the Lincoln Tomb then, say, Ronald, which is a good friend of mine, George Cashman, I have someone I want you to meet. So we went out to the Clayville Tavern outside of Springfield, which was then open, no longer is at the time, which was a stage stop. And Douglas and Lincoln and others would stop over as they changed stages at Clayville. 
And I went to the Playboy Tavern, my wife was joined me, and there was a fellow named Fleetwood Lindley. And he said, I want to meet, want you to meet Fleetwood. This is Ronald Greenfeld, Fleetwood Lindley, Ronald Greenfeld. We shook hands. You see, Fleetwood was 13 when his father invited him to the tomb in September of 1901 to be present at the last year of the infant body. He was the only person that age there. The Lincoln Honor Guard were all assembled, but his father told him, and he told me this, that there would come a call to his school in the morning, and the principal would tell him to get on his bicycle, and he said, head out to Oak Ridge Cemetery and say nothing to anyone but meet me at the back door of the Lincoln Tomb. And people did that, entered in this darkened room that put paper over the windows, and there in front of him was a coffin. The plumbers that had opened it in 1884 were back in 1901, and they opened up the lead lining very slowly, and a fetid smell emerged for a moment, and then everyone leaned forward and saw the features of the body of Abraham Lincoln. Fleetwood told me that any school child would have known it was the president's remains. The hair was there, the beard was intact, the only thing missing were the eyebrows. But the darkened, almost black flesh of the Springfield funeral on May 4th and 5th had dissipated, disappeared in a light white mold that covered his face and the light again. But on his hands were the gloves that Mrs. Lincoln had instructed, kid gloves, to put on his remains. I was horrified when Fleetwood told me that because Abraham Lincoln hated kid gloves. <laughs> in fact, in his coat, after his death, they found two pairs in his coat because he hated them so badly and they buried him with kid gloves. And there they were. There was the remains of a little silken American flag across the breast of his second inaugural suit that could be seen in Fleetwood's life. They all had their chance to work. And then the plumbers rolled the lead lining back and resealed it, closed the lid. And he said, I took one of the straps and held the lower the coffin of President Lincoln into a hole of 10 feet deep. Where they proceeded to put metal bars over it and pour some in through it. You talk about Jimmy Hoffa in cement. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln is in cement. The reason? There was an attempt to steal his body on the night of the election in 1876, November, the Hayes Tilden election. It was unsuccessful. Mrs. Lincoln was alive. Robert was alive. Horrified, there was an attempt to steal the remains of the president. So Robert wanted to bury his father so no one would ever disturb it again. And these were Robert's plans. And Fleetwood had been there. So when I would begin classes at Cal State in Lincoln or Civil War, I would begin with these words to my students. Your professor corresponded with the last living Civil War veterans. Your professor knew a man who knew Abraham Lincoln personally. And also knew the man who was the last to see the remains of the dead president before he was finally buried. And I get this gasp. How old are you? <laughs> but I remind them life is short. And I started early and young, so my lifetime crossed that of a generation now long gone. But it's been a great life. Um, 1963, I'm a graduate student at the University of Illinois. Sunday morning, getting ready for church. The phone rings. We've just had our first child, John, August 20th. I haven't left the apartment. Second floor, August. Know what that's like in Champaign. No air conditioning. We have a baby with colic and a mother-in-law present. <laughs> and a one-bedroom apartment. And I get a phone call. And the voice on the other end said, is Mr. Reitfeld there? I said, this is Mr. Reitfeld speaking. I'm very Dutch, of course. I say it like I see it. I didn't know who it was. And the voice said on the other end, I am Norman Rockwell, the painter. Well, I thought, 
that's a joke. <laughs> because he would say if he was a real Norman Rockwell, I'm the artist. But he said, painter. He said, Mrs. Randall told me that you would be a great guide for Mrs. Rockwell and me through Lincoln country. I've been commissioned to do a portrait of the young Lincoln for a bank in Spokane, Washington. So I'm here to do research. Would you be willing to be my guide? And my wife says, well, and I said, well, sure I can. I said, how soon? And he said, in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, I'm putting on my fancy pants anyway. Just continue to get dressed, and I did. And I thought, well, I wonder about this. I thought it was a graduate student. I almost said, who is this? Pulling a joke on me. You know, fellow grads sometimes do crazy things. But I didn't say anything, and lo and behold, the limousine pulled up, and this man got out with a pipe in his mouth, and it was the real article. <laughs> so I spent a day with him. The result of our day together is on the display behind you, to your right, of the young Lincoln with an axe in his hands and a leather book. I helped with that painting. And a few years later, 1965, he sent me a copy of it, a lithograph, personally signed to me with these words. My thanks to Ronald D. Riefeld for his expert advice in painting this picture of Lincoln. Cordially, Norman Rockwell. Well, I was tickled pink, but he sent it in a roll, and the postman stuffed it in the mailbox. <laughs> It was crunched. I was heart sick. So I wrote him back, Mr. Rockwell, do you know what the U.S. Post Office did to your picture? And I said, could you send me another one and, and, and write the same thing on it? <laughs> well, about two months later, I got it. This time it wasn't crunched. But I took the signature off of the first one and threw away the top. Later in 1970, we were at Laguna Beach at a special art display, and I saw an unsigned lithograph of rock <laughs> nearly $10,000, which I threw away, and all I needed was an iron with a little moisture and iron out the wrinkles. These are regrets one has. <laughs> but it was a pleasure to help rock them. At the inauguration of Eisenhower, Exactly 57 years ago yesterday, I was the youngest official guest invited to President Eisenhower's inauguration in Washington, January 20, 1953. And I went and stayed with Congressman Paul Cunningham, 5th District of Iowa, good friend, some of you remember, all And while we were getting ready for the inaugural on the 19th, he got a call for Congressman George Don Darrow of Michigan upstairs in the House office building and said, I've got something that Ronald needs to see. He knew about my discovering the Lincoln Fellow. He said, send Ronald up. So Paul took me upstairs and he said, Ronald, sit down, I have to show you something. And he thrust into my hands a letter to A.B. Lincoln, written by Grace Bedell. I held the letter that Grace Waddell wrote to Lincoln, suggesting he'd be far more handsome if he grew a beard. And when you go to the display in the uh, history of caravan, you will find the letter spelled out there. So you will see what I saw on the 19th of January, 1953. Congressman Don Darrow had received it from Grace herself. It was the letter. And on, on that letter, uh, I remember thinking, I wonder what the value of this is. <laughs> but the letter he sent back to her, which is today in, in private hands, sold for over a million dollars. Those letters are not available. That answer of Lincoln's is not available to any library It's in private hands. I wish libraries had those opportunities. And then I received word from the state historian 
We want to fly you to Springfield. We're going to work on planning a new museum for President Lincoln. So for a better part of two years, I flew from California to St. Louis, from St. Louis to Springfield, and the plane from St. Louis to Springfield is just high enough to detassel. <laughs> Barely above the cornfields. And we put together what is today the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum. And if you've not been there, I highly recommend you to do that. It was a challenge to decide what to share of Lincoln's life. And we wanted it to be young people friendly. And it is. A few of my suggestions are still there. I suggested the Lincoln cabinet scene is still there. I worked on the death scene at Will, the bed of the Prince of Wales room, which is there. And it's nice to walk through and think, well, I was there when it happened. And we're happy that young people are pouring in droves to see that museum. We had a grand scholar recently, not long ago, pass away, John Roy Simon, a dear friend of mine from 1962 on, who, however, criticized it. He called it Six Flags Over Springfield <laughs> because we used the latest technology to recommend to young people. But be young and go and enjoy it. And then, of course, it was mentioned, I had the pleasure of being an advisor to the President Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission. My life has been full, and I'm grateful to Mr. Lincoln. I never met the man in this life, but without question, he not only saved the nation, but in some ways he helped save the life of a boy who was always sick and gave him a reason to survive. That's me. And thank you for letting me be here. suggest that I'm a product of that encouragement to a certain degree. My family came to the United States from the Netherlands in 1847. My father's family founded a town called Pella, Iowa. <laughs> I'm a part of the bunch that established the community. The leader of that colony with my grandfather was Henry Peter Scalti. And in 1859, Scalti left the Democratic Party to join a Republican Party over the slavery issue. In 1856, he published a, a booklet, an article, as a result of his newspaper activity, attacking the institution of slavery as a Democrat. And in 1959, here in Iowa, he switched to the Republican Party, became a major leader in the Iowa Republican Party. As a result of that, he was very active in the campaign of 1860. After missing from 1868 to two years ago, I found in a bank vault in Pella the missing journals of Reverend Scalti from 1868 to two years ago. I found two of the three that survived in which he spells out his personal relationship with Abraham Lincoln. I can document now the days he met Lincoln I can document now that after he left the Wigwam Convention as one of the vice presidents because he's a foreigner, 
to attract the foreign vote, he immediately went to Washington to translate into Dutch and possibly German Seward and Lincoln speeches to attract the immigrant vote to the Republican Party, which he did. Coming back from Washington, the family has long forgotten this. I found the evidence that he went straight to Springfield and on June 13, 1860, visited Abraham Lincoln, discovering that they both had the same identical shawl, which you can see Scalty's today at the Scalty house in his office upstairs on the second floor. Lincoln was concerned about the immigrants. He even owned a German newspaper for a time in Illinois. He was upset with the know-nothings and the American party who were anti-Catholic and anti-immigrant. Mrs. Lincoln was a know-nothing in her sympathies, but not her husband. Very clearly, Lincoln supported the immigrants in this country, and especially during the four years appointed Brigadier Generals, partly because of their nationality. Not especially good military folks, if you know some of those generals, but like one he loved the name of Schindelfinnig, and he appointed him a general just for his name, <laughs> attracting the immigrant vote. So my answer is yes. He was very concerned about the future of the nation and immigrants were part of that. And my family were part of that. Any other questions? Yes. Um, did it sure No, I didn't hear the question. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true that in 1876 they dug up Lincoln's body to see if he would run again for office? Is that what oh. you just <laughs> Yeah, they, they tried to re-elect him. Is it true that they tried to re-elect him as president because they didn't like any of the any other candidates? They didn't like any other candidates, so they tried to re-elect him for president? <laughs> 1876? You were there, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> it slips my mind. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Sorry, it was long gone by that time. Yes. I'm curious uh, about the, what is left to learn about Lincoln. I mean, it, it, so many books published, uh, so much research. What new is being discovered yet today about uh, Abraham Lincoln? Well, I can answer that partly on the Lincoln Legals Project because um, in 1952, when I was in Springfield with the Pats, Marion was uh, assistant editor, associate editor of the Collected Works, and she was working on those papers at the time. I remember them telling me they were doing nothing for the law career of Lincoln in the Collected Works. They would have to, that would have to be another project some other day, but not for the Collected Works. That was 1952. They have been working on it very successfully. What I think they found 5,000 uh, documents associated with Lincoln's law career. There's a whole new field opening on Lincoln's legal practice, proving that he was an excellent lawyer, great jury lawyer, but just an excellent lawyer, period. And that's something new for the Lincoln story. There are, of course, always rehashing that goes on every generation. Every generation takes a new look at Lincoln from their perspective. I well remember, some of you are old enough to remember the 1960s, where they turned, in some cases, Lincoln on his head in the civil rights movement, accusing him of being a white supremacist, which he was not. Nevertheless, Jerome Bennett in the Ebony magazine published that approach. But thankfully, people like now deceased um, Franklin, John Hope Franklin, didn't accept it. Jim McPherson of Princeton, Professor Emeritus, is still writing about it, not accepting it. And I'm happy to see the field correcting its now. Alan Gels has published a work on him as an emancipator. And we're finally putting that issue in perspective to rest. I've lived long enough that at the moment I'm standing in front of you, I am probably one of the oldest Lincoln scholars left in the country. I'm still uh, around. David Donald has passed away. And we have a few others older than myself left, but for the most part, folks, I'm the last of the Mohicans. <laughs> and I am bridging a gap between the old Lincoln scholars and a new crop coming up. 
doing excellent research, I have to say. I don't buy everything they conclude, but remember, I'm Dutch. <laughs> yes. Whoever, there were three hands at once. Yes, somebody. I wonder if you would uh, comment on Lincoln's self-education. I think that's a subject of interest to you, and, and, and his formal education was so brief. Yes. I just have almost finished a book on Lincoln self-education. Almost had it finished in Pell Island. I mentioned that time somewhere before. Um, Lincoln had at the most one year of what we call formal schooling in three different schools. That was it. His mother could not write, but she could read. So from the early days at his mother's knee, she read scripture. And as they got older, then Sally, his sister, and he would take turns reading scripture. He learned to read partly with scripture. And those scriptural verses fixed themselves in his memory so clearly that in his White House years, he could come up with chapter and verse for all kinds of situations and could read them. Of course, that's King James Version now, the authorized version, and he could do it perfectly well. But he had such a hunger for learning that he read, Louis Warren said, probably true, every book available within 50 miles of his home in Indiana. Borrowed from a neighbor, in one case he borrowed a book on Washington, put it up in, in the roof into a chink and it rained during that night and spoiled the volume. It took him three days of working in cornfields to pay for the book, which is probably the first book Lincoln ever owned. So he was hungry to learn, but also to write. In his Indiana years already, he's an amanuensis for neighbors who can't write letters. Lincoln writes them for them, for business or whatever. So he early is writing and reading. That's a desire he continues the whole life through. Early, he learned to love Shakespeare, Robert Burns' poetry, um, yeah, even the raven, he had that memorized. And he loved literature. On a boat outside of, on the shores of Virginia in 1865, he's down there at the time visiting Grant. And what's he reading? He's reading Shakespeare and the Bible, 1865. He could quote huge portions of Shakespeare's works. His favorite was Macbeth. He liked Hamlet as well. The man taught himself to read and write and to figure. He was using Euclid to train his head in thinking in the area of mathematics as a lawyer. This man collected a few books, not a huge library, but he kept it as his law office. And thereby is the story that when he left the office, Herndon, his law partner, 16 years, supposedly said, Lincoln gave him his books, gave them to Herndon. Mary Lincoln said, no, that was our personal library, and Herndon stole it. <laughs> Robert Lincoln got involved with it and asked Herndon for the books back because he was an aspiring lawyer he was going to Harvard, and he wanted his father's law books, and Herndon said, no, that his father had given them to him. So Lincoln's personal library doesn't exist anymore. It's been scattered across the world. But his hunger and his desire remain his whole life. And that amazing. That amazing. Could you uh, comment about the <clears throat> Gettysburg Address, rank it among presidential speeches that have been given in America, how it would rank, if it was possible to do that, and then <laughs> comment about the immediate reaction and how it was received uh, by the people that were present and heard. That's almost a three part question. Uh, let me say, first of all, um, 
he carefully authored the address. He began it in the White House on White House stationery. He probably didn't finish touches on it until he was in Gettysburg. He certainly didn't put under God in it until he spoke it deliberately. Then in the copies afterwards, he inserted under God in the text. The Bliss copy, which is at the White House, which I have seen, and the so-called Lincoln Bedroom, has under God in it, and it was a copy he wrote out in March of 1864. So he was still making copies in his presidency, and he lived to see the appreciation of it as an address in his lifetime, although he considered his second inaugural address to be finer than his first address. As far as the reaction of the crowd, there are various opinions. Uh, my personal feeling is, after two hours of listening, to the order, people were tired and were milling around. There were a lot of people that missed perhaps what the president was saying because it gave him about two or three minutes. He's up, he's down. But there was applause. And the press has recorded applause in various sites of the address. So some people heard it. And, and certainly the keynote speaker heard it of that day and complimented Lincoln immediately after he delivered on being finer than what he had said. Now you have to remember the keynote speaker is the leading orator in the nation at that time. Okay? He spent hours memorizing the whole two-hour address and delivered it from memory. It was the last major speech he will ever give. I don't think it killed him. <laughs> it was the last one he ever gave, and yet this man said to the president, "I'd like a copy." So we have a copy that was given to him. Lincoln lived to see it appreciated, but he still called his second inaugural, which has something like 14 quotes or allusions to King James scripture in it, as a final piece of work. Any other questions? And that burial, uh, you mentioned that was um, 10 feet from concrete. Was that, is that the final resting? Or that's that, it. How about the one before? Was it a different no, that's location? it. One location? That's one location where he is now. Okay. Uh, Ripley's, believe it or not, in the 1940s, had an article on Lincoln's uh, burial and said he was moved 17 times. I don't know if that's true, but he sure didn't rest very well. <laughs> so 19 months. Thank you. Thank you very much.